Hi there! It sometimes happens that we build something out of necessity to help us with little day-to-day -day tasks, and this is the case for today's project. The boy's room in my basement is a very cramped place that I need to access frequently because I keep in there a freezer with groceries. It turns out that I often have my hands full when I come back from taking something, and it is difficult to reach for the light switch. To obviate to this problem, I decided to build an automatic light switch so I don't have to maneuver it manually anymore. And since I was at that, I decided to make one that not just turns off when I leave the room, but also turns on a light automatically when I enter the room. Let's take a look at it. The core of this device, technically called an occupancy sensor, is a PIR, or Passive Infrared, sensor. I have a version of it called HCSR501 that puts together a pyroelectric infrared detector, or PID, with a bunch of other electronic components that make the sensor usable with very few external components. The PID is concealed underneath that white little dome, which is nothing more than a Fresnel lens that concentrates the light on the actual sensor, thus increasing its sensitivity. The PID used in this device is called the LHI778 and is capable of detecting infrared emissions over a background noise of up to 85 degrees Celsius. You can see from its datasheet that it is like a small metallic cylinder with four pins coming out of it. This PID actually contains two infrared sensors connected in series to increase its sensitivity. Here instead is the schematic of the whole device with the PIR on the left. The rest of the circuitry is used to decode the signals emitted by the detector and provides a digital output on pin 2 of the header on the right side. Pin 1 and 3 provide instead the power supply for the whole circuit, internally stabilized to 3.3V by this IC called 7133-1. This arrangement allows us to power the device with any voltage between 5 and 20V DC. This one is a picture of the device PCB. Note the presence of a jumper that can be set in two different modalities, single and repeat trigger. We will use the single trigger modality, so we will keep the jumper in the position shown in the picture. Note also the two trim pots on the bottom side. The one on the left allows us to set the appropriate sensitivity for our needs, and the second adjusts the time delay generated by the internal circuitry. When the sensor detects somebody's presence, it will bring a pin 2 of the header to logical 1, and it will keep it that way for an amount of time that is equal to the time delay set on the right trim pot. The time starts to be counted when the person is not detected anymore. This one is the schematic I made to use the PIR motion detector. The detector is connected to the pin header J1 on the left. The header provides the power supply for the detector on pins 1 and 3 and captures the output signal on pin 2. The signal from the detector goes to the base of transistor Q1, which pilots a relay and is used to control the light of the room where the device is located. The 5 volt power supply for the transistor and the relay comes from an old USB charger, so I didn't have to build a power supply just for this application. LED1 and R1 provide a visual indication that tells us when the gadget is turned on. The actual power supply for the whole thing comes directly from a 120V socket, goes through a 1 amp fuse, and through a power switch. When the switch is set to on, both the USB charger and the common terminal of the relay receive the 120V. Power socket J3 receives the 120V only when the switch is on, and simultaneously the PIR detects the presence of a person. And this is the circuit mounted on a perf board. This one is the transistor that controls the relay. These three terminal blocks are those that handles the 120V. Note how I labeled in black the hot side of the blocks to make sure I could connect properly everything together. 
This first one brings the power to the USB charger. This other one goes directly to the power cable that plugs into the 120V power supply socket after going through the fuse and the switch that will be mounted indirectly on the case walls. The last terminal block is the one for connecting the power sockets controlled by the device. On the opposite side of the terminal blocks we have two pin headers. This one with two pins will be used to connect the LED, which will be mounted on the side panel of the device. This other one, with three pins, is the one that connects to the PIR module. And finally, this is the USB cable that connects to the USB charger and provides the plus 5V to power the low-voltage circuitry of the device. The whole device will be hosted in this 3D printer case. This big hole is, of course, the one for the 120V sockets block, which can be easily put in this position and hold in place through its screws that fit perfectly with the two holes closest to the rectangular big hole. On top of the sockets block, we will have to put a mask like this to prevent accidental touching of the power wires inside. On this side we have several holes. This one is for the power switch. This other one in the center is for the power cable, and this one on the side is for the fuse holder. The LED will sit in this little hole close to the power switch. The PIR will be mounted on the opposite side. The case has this lid that can be inserted this way and held in place with side screws. The lid has two flaps with holes that can be used to screw firmly the device on a wall or a pole. I use the different kind of cables for the various connections. The ones I'm prepping right now are the kind that will carry the 120V all around the device. Since they are stranded wires, I solder them at the two ends, and for that I use some liquid rosin to help the solder attach firmly to the wires. I use the wires of different colors to distinguish the hot ones from the neutral and the ground ones and I attach them to the socket's block before positioning it to the case, to make it easier to tighten the terminal screws. The socket is held in place on the panel through its own screws, normally used to attach it to the receptacles on a wall. I just had to make sure to put holes on the panel small enough to force the screws in and guarantee a secure assemblage. Once the socket's assembly was in place, I added the mask on top of it, which I secured with two more screws, which are the ones that come with the mask. Next I assembled the PIR on the side wall. I hold it in place with a couple of M2 nylon screws and nuts, which perfectly fit in the holes present on the PCB. Once the PIR was in place, I inserted a cable on its pin header. The cable is multicolored to easily figure out in which direction it needs to be connected to the path forward on its other end, which is exactly what I did next. After the three wires flat cable was connected, I attached the socket wires to the appropriate terminal block. Once that was done, I attached the fuse holder to the other side panel using the hardware that comes with it. To protect the power cables from the accidental cutting of the insulator, I also added to the side panel a grommet on the appropriate sides. Then I inserted the switch into the panel. The switch is the kind that has flaps that lock on the internal side of the panel and hold it in place without any further hardware. And now it was the time to connect the power cable. Make sure you use the kind with three prongs, and therefore three wires in it, so that you can connect also the ground to the device. To avoid the cable from sliding out, I added some insulating tape to thicken it, so it cannot go through the grommet anymore. This cable had wires of three different colors, blue, brown and yellow, to distinguish the hot wire, the neutral wire and the ground wire. Whenever I connect one of these wires to the components on the panel, I make sure to also use some shrink tube for insulation. I started with the ground wire, which is the yellow one, and I connected it to the ground wire of the socket's assembly. I also soldered the two parts together to make sure they won't be able to detach and cause problems later on. Then I covered the joint with the shrink tube and heated it. 
Next, I connected the hot wire, which is the blue one, to one of the connectors of the fuse holder, making sure to also use the shrink tube and solder. The other connector of the fuse holder went then to one end of the power switch, where I used the same technique to make the wiring. Uh, it just occurred to me that it would be better to attach to the hot wire first the switch and then the fuse, so that the fuse holder can be powered down by the switch before opening it to add or replace the fuse. Make sure to do the wiring that way instead of the way I did it in my prototype. It is much safer, actually. Next step was to wire the hot and neutral from the power supply to the appropriate terminal block on the perf board. For that, I also needed to attach another wire to the other terminal of the switch. At this point, the last thing to mount and connect was the USB charger. For that, I cut two wires that I soldered on one end to the prongs of the charger and connected to the appropriate terminal block on the other side. Note how much liquid rosin I used to make sure I could solder the wires to the nickel-covered prongs. To attach the USB charger to an internal wall of the case, I decided to use some hot glue, which works very well with the PLA I used to 3D print the box. Once that was in place, I connected the USB cable from the perf board to the charger, and added also a piece of insulating foam between the perf board and the rest of the circuit, and then attached the wires from the charger to the terminal block on the perf board. And it was now that I realized I didn't yet connect the LED. So I took a flat cable with two wires and a female header on one side, I connected the other side of the wires to the LED, using again a shrink tube for insulation, I inserted the LED in this hole and connected the female header to the two-pin header on the perf board, making sure I polarized correctly the LED, otherwise, of course, it would never turn on. As a safe measure, I also decided to drop some hot glue on the LED and all the mechanical components on the inside of the case to prevent any screw or nut to get loose over time. Done. Well, uh, almost. Still needed to tune the two three inputs for the sensitivity and the timing. So, I, I inserted a power tester on the socket on top of the main panel to check the presence of the 120 volt, then added the fuse to the fuse holder and plugged in the device into the power supply. I increased the time delay to almost the max and then I turned the sensitivity with a trial and error method. So, first I set a value, I move my hand in front of the sensor to check if it was sensitive enough, then I readjust the sensitivity and try again, until I was satisfied. Actually, I tried to make the device really sensitive to make sure it would immediately turn on the lights as soon as someone comes close. Time now to put the lid back on and fix it with some screws. Let's see now how this occupancy sensor works in a real environment. I have already installed it in the boiler room in the basement. This is the door that brings to the room. You can see that the room is currently in the dark. Now let's completely open the door. And yes, the lights turn on immediately. Perfect. And there is the device, attached to the roof and relatively close to the door, so it can immediately sense the presence of a person. So, the project is completed and even my wife is now enjoying the results. She was actually always complaining that the light switch in the boiler room was too difficult to reach. Now she doesn't have to worry about it anymore. And you? Do you think such a device could be useful for you too? Let me know in the comments and let me know also how you would use it. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next video and as usual, happy experiments!